the morning. I know many of us are still a little tired. So I thank you all for being here. My name is Gabrielle. I'm a second year law student at Lewis and Clark. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Jessica Bloom serves as Deputy Director of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Prior to joining the Ethics Commission, Ms. Bloom was a senior staff attorney for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Ms. Delcy Winders is the Academic Fellow of the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program. Prior to becoming an Academic Fellow, Ms. Winders taught Animal Law at Tulane University School of Law and Loyola University of New Orleans. A quick little administrative reminder, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, you need to sign in and also sign out. The sign-in sheets are right outside the door. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction, Gabrielle. I want to add that um, prior to my involvement with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, I was an assistant attorney general at the Missouri Attorney General's Office for six and a half years. And there I founded the Canine Cruelty Prevention Unit and uh, was able to actually enforce the state's animal welfare laws against puppy mills. Through deterrence, we shut down about 1,000 of the 3,000 puppy mills that are there. And as of today, <laughs> as of today, there are only 1,500 left. So the, uh, the enforcement of the law actually had a deterrent effect to that. That's ongoing. I mention that because I know there's a career in animals, animal law, well, panel coming up, or maybe it has already happened, I can't recall. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows you don't have to get a job at the Animal Legal Defense Fund or PETA or HSUS in order to do animal law work. You can make your own work wherever you might be lucky enough to get a job. So after that uh, little dalliance, <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about the Cricket Hall Zoo. Um, so I was the lead counsel in the Cricket Hall Zoo case along with two outstanding attorneys, uh, Elizabeth Holmes from Brulu River Law and Jeff Pierce, who is now legislative counsel at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, I want to start off by showing you, we got excellent press coverage um, by the Des Moines Register in, because the Cricket Hall Zoo is located in Iowa. And I want to start off by showing you a little tour that they took of the zoo. They call it a 60 second tour of the Cricket Hall Zoo. Um, it's, all, it's kind of fast and the video is a little grainy, but you can kind of get an idea at least of the smallness of the zoo and of the types of animals that they have there by watching it and video is always helpful. So hopefully it's teed up. I want to also mention that while you're watching this, Note that the conditions of the facility with notice. The Cricket Hollow Zoo gave permission to the Des Moines Register photographer to come two weeks before the Cricket Hollow Zoo photographer, or the Des Moines Register photographer came. And that's it. That's the end of it. That's the size and scope of what we're dealing of what we were dealing with. So, okay. So, the, as I mentioned, the Cricket Hall Zoo is located in Iowa. For those of you that don't know where Iowa is, I provided a helpful map. Uh, that Iowa often gets confused with Idaho and Ohio, so it's a preemptive strike. Uh, Cricket Hall Zoo is in Manchester, Iowa, which is in the northeast corner of Iowa. This area of the Midwest is known for a lot of snow and freezing cold temperatures, which is important. This is an aerial shot of the zoo you just took a, a virtual tour of. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the cropland. That is also owned by the owners of the Cricket Hall Zoo. Their names are Tom and Pamela Selner. And up in the right-hand corner, you can see some vestiges of what is their dairy operation. They have a, about a 50 cattle dairy operation going on at the zoo. That became important to us because she doesn't have any secure biosecurity protocols. So in the morning, she goes and she milks her cows, and then she goes straight to the zoo and transfers diseases back and forth. Um, so the Cric we learned about the Cricket Hollow Zoo through a series of news reports about an animal attack that occurred at the zoo. A tiger named Shere Khan escaped his enclosure and attacked the Tom Selner, the um, husband of the husband-wife duo, duo that owns this zoo. Uh, Mr. Selner suffered severe injuries to his head and his back and was life flighted on a helicopter to Des Moines to, to receive life-saving treatment. He did survive. 
Um, but Shere Khan also survived, so that's the good news in this case. Um, they, they do purport to love their animals, and for all intents and purposes, we have no reason to doubt that other than their pattern of, t of deplorable acts. Um, so <laughs> so the, the Selner is, um, the, there's a dangerous wild animal law in Iowa that should prevent them from owning these types of animals for this very reason, because they can escape. Um, and we learned about that dangerous wild animal law when we were researching the Cricket Hollow Zoo. Uh, after we, and so it, it became interesting to us why the Cricket Hollow Zoo was allowed to keep a tiger who actually attacked somebody in spite of a prohibition in Iowa for the possession of dangerous wild animals. And through our research, we found um, five plaintiffs who had spoken out about the Cricket Hollow Zoo either through letters to the USDA or letters to the editor to local newspapers. One of their names was Tracy Keel, so she's the main um, person. Uh, through, our, through our research, we developed a series of claims, and I'm going to talk about all five of those claims today. Um, they involve uh, federal, federal law and state law, and attempts at getting local law enforcement to do something, um, which I actually don't include in the count of five because the local law enforcement refused to act. Our first step was, though, to reach out to local law enforcement. They told us that they had visited the zoo on numerous occasions um, and that they felt nothing was wrong. So they were, that, that was a non-starter. Our plaintiff group kept writing letters to local law enforcement so that they were constantly apprised of updates through litigation and different things that we found out. And to date, they still haven't taken any action. Uh, that'll be shocking to you as we get through the evidence in the case. Um, the first case I want to talk to you about is an Endangered Species Act Section 9 case. The Endangered Species Act protects uh, wi endangered wildlife in the United States, and it applies to captive wildlife. Within Section 9, there's a prohibition on the take of wildlife. And take um, can mean possess, deliver, sell, transport wildlife that's been taken or that has been um, used in commercial activity. The term take means harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, etc. cetera. I, I bold the terms harass and harm because that's what we use when we're applying the Endangered Species Act Section 9 take prohibitions to captively held wildlife. Unless you can prove that an animal was intentionally shot or wounded while being held in captivity, you're really going to be focusing on harass and harm. There was a little bit of debate, and there still is among the regulated community, and the regulated community being the people who are owning these animals, that the Endangered Species Act somehow doesn't apply to captive wildlife, but the case, is, or the statute and the regulations are clear. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has always said, these are the most recent pronouncements, that the Endangered Species Act in its entirety applies to captive wildlife. So just because an endangered animal might be owned by somebody and put in a cage doesn't mean it loses their wildlife protections. You still can't breed them, you still can't trade them across borders, you still can't harass and harm them, or just kill them because you want to, just because you, you happen to put them in a cage. So harass means an intentional act or negligent act or an intentional or negligent act or omission that creates a likely of injury to wildlife by annoying it to such an extent as to significantly disrupt normal behavioral patterns. So that's a pretty broad prohibition. Fish and Wildlife Service recognized that and the regulated community was in an uproar, specifically the zoos. So they included a, an exception for when applied to captive wildlife, again, evincing that it actually does apply to captive wildlife on its face, the, the, this definition of take and harass doesn't include generally accepted animal husbandry practices that meet or exceed the minimum standards for facilities under the Animal Welfare Act. This becomes incredibly important when you're litigating these cases because you always have, these, these, these facilities are um, what we call roadside zoos that are owning these captively held animals. Sometimes, we do have a couple of cases against AZA accredited facilities, and Delcy will talk about those. But on, on the, um, the battleground, for the most part, we're, we're dealing with roadside zoos, which aren't accredited by any organization. The only oversight they have is the United States Department of Agriculture through the Animal Welfare Act. So you usually have a treasure trove of inspection reports um, done by inspectors with the USDA about these facilities. And you can tell from them that the facilities are not meeting or exceeding the Animal Welfare Act. When you have an Animal Welfare Act inspection report that's silent on a subject, then you're free to make up your own arguments about what meets or exceeds generally accepted animal husbandry practices, right? The Animal Welfare Act then becomes just one part of what could be a generally accepted animal husbandry practice. So this is a chart that I made for trial. This is called a demonstrative exhibit as a practice point. Um, I aggregated all of the, and actually I didn't aggregate all of these. Alina Nello, if she's in the room, did this when she was a clerk for ALDF. Um, she, she aggregated all of the different in, types of inspection 
uh, violations that have been or animal effect violations that have been documented in inspections since 2010. We could have gone back farther because we had the documents, but we wanted to make it clear to the court we weren't trying to kitchen sink these people. We just were, tr we're just saying this is recent, and this trial took place in 2015, so we went back five years. Where there's a T documented, that means it had a direct impact on tigers. Where there's an L documented, it had a direct impact on lemurs. Where there's a W, it had a direct impact on wolves. Tigers, lemurs, and wolves were the animals that were uh, covered by the Endangered Species Act living at the zoo when we went to trial. So the first, the first um, claim that we focused on was lemurs. Uh, lemurs are very small primate non-human primates that are only located in their natural habitats in Madagascar, which is an island off of um, Africa. We had the preeminent lemur uh, expert, Dr. Peter Klotfer, come testify at trial. After reviewing a series of information documents that we gave him, primarily USDA animal welfare inspection reports for the zoo, these are some of those um, some of the citations that dealt directly with lemurs. And I want to read some of them to you so that you can get an idea. Of of what kind of was going on. So in the storage area inside the lemur building, there was rodent feces, feathers, dirt, and dry kibble on the floor, spider webs and cobwebs in the wire enclosing the area. The refrigerator contained several pieces of fruit that were moldy or rotten. Um, Pam Selner at trial later testified she gave the lemurs fruit as part of their enrichment activity. So she gave them fruit as a special treat that was moldy and rotten. Excessive number of flies in the reptile house, which is where the lemurs were located. The ringtail lemur and red ruffed lemur could see the reptiles from their enclosures. And in the wild, uh, reptiles are the only predator for lemurs. So this, this created a very heightened physical uh, state for them. They were constantly uh, terrified. The inspectors noted brown stains throughout the surface of the lemur wall enclosures. These are scent markings, and Dr. Klopfer testified that the fact that those scent markings that were present and were not being monitored in any way by anybody with expertise was an indication that the lemurs weren't like interacting in a, in a normal way with their environment, and no one and, and without like extensive study, he couldn't tell whether or not those scent markings were actually impeding their olfactory senses. Uh, coupled with the amount of feces and everything that was in the in the enclosures, Dr. Klopper said that this interference with the olfactory senses, which which are highly attuned, according to Dr. Klopper, uh, it was extremely detrimental to the lemurs. He said, to use an analogy, having them in a smelling environment is like having us be in a room where there's constantly white noise being amplified. So that would be cruel and unusual punishment for humans. For for captive wildlife, it's the same. Um, this is a this is a quotation from. Um, our, our plaintiff, one of our plaintiffs, uh, he testified that he could, when he when he approached the facility, he noticed a rotting type of smell. He said every time he sees this photo, it angers him because he knows how social the animals are, and he could tell that this animal was suffering. This is um, Za this is Zabu, the a ringtail lemur. I'm sorry, this is Chucky, a ringtail lemur that lived in isolation for three years, in between periods of time when he was given a mate, a single mate. Um, I should note that lemurs in captivity live in family units of uh, 15 or more. So Dr. Klotfer testified repeatedly and emphatically that keeping these lemurs in small colonies of uh, one or two was so detrimental to their, um, their mental state that they were likely catatonic. In fact, I have um, a, a direct quote from Dr. Klopfer here. This hunched posture is that of a depressed lemur, and if the rest of the cage was as barren as the photograph discloses, then of course I come to the conclusion that this is a harrowing confinement situation. The animal is probably in near catatonic state, probably has a very high heart rate, undoubtedly has elevated non-adrenaline levels, and probably is relatively insensitive at this moment to acoustic stimuli, which is pathological for these animals. The judge was riveted by Dr. Klopfer's testimony, and what, which is why it's so important to have reputable experts that will testify on your side. And, and I, I would say we did not have trouble finding any for this case. Um, Dr. Klopfer, with particularity, testify, would testify that it, this case kept him up at night personally, because he wanted to be able to do something for all of the animals. Um, the judge said that housing lemurs in these types of conditions constituted harassment under the Endangered Species Act. Um, there's This is Lucy's red, red luff lemur cage, no one has ever seen Lucy. She's, she sits in the back of her cage in darkness and has been living in isolation for 16 years. So um, the next uh, thing I wanted to show you is the, um, this is the 
uh, enrichment plan for Lucy and Chucky at the Chucky at the zoo. Zabu was later added. Um, she says that this is this is all that she does to ensure their psychological well-being. Um, and then, okay. So now I want to talk to you about the tigers. We also want as to the tigers. This is the feces ridden in, in um, water logged enclosures where they live. The one in the middle in the bottom right is Casper, and the one in the top right is Casper. Casper is no longer alive. Um, so these are these are testimonies um, by people who visited the zoo and served as plaintiffs. They they constantly witnessed excessive flies and animal waste. I mean, we're absolutely disgusted by the enclosures. Um, the USDA noted that there are several enclosures throughout the facility with the buildup of feces and animal waste, and they also noted an excessive number of flies. This is a dead rodent in a water enclosure with green water, and there's a close-up of Casper's cage. Casper only lived at the facility for a few months. I'll talk about him a little bit more here in a minute. So harm in the definition of take means that you actually injure or kill wildlife. Okay, we've, the, the, this is the um, demonstrative exhibit we put together for the number of animals at the Cricket Hollow Zoo that died from veterinary neglect during their time at the Cricket Hollow Zoo. And this is only the endangered animals. That's all we know about. So we have wolves here, lemurs, tigers, um, and lions. And there, sadly, this is not a complete list um, because since we filed our case, we have learned that another lion died named Dandelion. Uh, so this is, uh, again, Ty Casper's enclosure. Let me find this document. Okay. So um, the, the, ti the timeline for Casper became very important because it, Casper's and Mirage's deaths, which happened after we filed the case but before trial, allowed us to show the judge exactly how animals are treated. We had actual real-time evidence of how animals are treated. So July uh, 2014 is when Casper was acquired by the Cricket Hollow Zoo. That August, their the veterinarian, Dr. Priest, evaluated Casper but prescribed no treatment. In October, USDA writes an inspection report, that's what you're seeing here, noting open sores and wounds and a thin body condition, protruding hips, apparent starvation, and orders Selner to get the vet back out. On October 9th, Dr. Priest, the vet, comes back out to see Casper, prescribes a low dose of amoxicillin. This is all his treatment. And in the water, says put it in his regular water. Don't do anything else. He'll be fine. He verbally tells her that the tiger can continue licking his open wound because if he licks it, it will heal, like if a cat licks an open wound. In November, Casper dies from an infection as a result of the untreated wound. When our, when our veterinarian, Dr. Um, Jennifer Conrad testified. She said that there is absolutely no way that the cause of Casper's death was natural causes, and he absolutely died from lack of veterinary care. So this is Mirage. Mirage died um, under similar conditions, he, except that he developed an, a spontaneous, um, she, Pam Selner called it a spontaneous uh, inability to use his back right leg. Uh, paralysis, spontaneous paralysis. This is this was likely because he got into a fight or got stuck or something bad happened to him. Um, but she called it she calls everything spontaneous. So um, this time, this time under increased scrutiny, Dr. Priest tried a little bit more. He gave the animal um, a couple of injections and then, but once again, still prescribing am amoxicillin in water. I can't even take amoxicillin anymore. It doesn't work on me anymore. And yet they're giving it to this, you know, multiple or huge tiger. So Mirage never got better and was euthanized by Dr. Priest on July 1. During, it's worth noting that during this period when Mirage was sick and being treated, the Cricket Hollow Zoo's license had been suspended by the USDA. And Dulcie will talk a little bit more about the license suspension procedures. But because the license was suspended, the Cricket Hollow Zoo wasn't open to the public. USDA still has an obligation to come and check on the animals. And they usually come more frequently during those license suspension times because the public isn't there to report severe violations to them. USDA attempted to inspect the facility on three different occasions during this license suspension period, and the Selners weren't home. So Mirage is deathly ill, is receiving all this medical care from the uh, inadequate medical care, but still frequent visits from the zoo, and she's not responding to USDA inspectors. It's very suspicious. She didn't want to have a citation on her report for trial that said that she had been um, had had another tiger that needed veterinary care. So her license was lifted. Uh, was the license suspension was lifted on July 1, and on that same day, Dr. Priest euthanized the animal. Um, so Dr. Conrad obviously testified that inadequate veterinary care led to his death. 
Um, just to give you a kind of a picture, from 2005 to 2015, the Creek Owl Zoo spent a total of $7,000 for their animals in veterinary care per year. The zoo has 300 animals. All of the R experts, Conrad Klopfer and then a zoo administrator from the Blank Park Zoo in Des Moines, David Allen, testified that a better total, a better ballpark for veterinary care is 1,000 per year. And that, that's an average, so it doesn't include that large carnivores like tigers and lions should be getting a lot more treatment. We won, in, in, we won this case, I think, as many of you know, um, and our keys to winning this case involved uh, this, this incredibly inadequate undercapitalization by the Cricket Hollow Zoo. You can, this is literally how they keep their accounting records. I am not making this up. This is a piece of evidence from trial. They write things down from their memory on notes, okay? So you can see in the veterinary care column, at the, at the most, she spent ever $2,000 a year. The judge held that um, the violations were pervasive, long-standing, and ongoing. If they were not removed from the defendant's care, then the violations were likely to continue, and the only appropriate relief would be to, allow, to remove them from the facility. Now, sadly, the judge also gave the defendants, you'll see in here, defendants must transfer the lamers to a facility that's capable of meeting their care. He determined that um, that meant that the defendants had a choice in where the animals went, so long as they could prove that it was that they were meeting their obligations by finding a facility with appropriate care. We challenged that determination in court, held another hearing, it was an extensive hearing, and um, the judge ruled with the defendants and, and allowed these animals to go to, uh, the lemurs went to a roadside zoo in Wisconsin, and the tigers went to um, a, a sanctuary, a sanctuary in Indiana. So um, we are actually in Eighth Circuit right now. They, the defendants filed an appeal and we are appealing that remedies determination. So briefly, I have one slide about these um, other or these other cases. I guess I have, I have to. I have quite a few on. So the first time we went to trial, the lions were not listed. The second time, when lions became listed, we filed an immediate notice letter. Here is a picture of Kamara. I'm trying. I'm sorry. I have to hurry now because I don't want to cut into Delcy's time so much. Kamara uh, later uh, died from uh, pancreatitis. This is a picture of Johnwa. Jo John wa, uh, we were able to rescue in our second case. So John was now living at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. This is a picture of John in June, 20, uh, in June uh, 2016. Um, she's, she can't walk, she can't move, and she's having trouble breathing. Her veterinarian, um, a couple of days later, went out and did an evaluation of John because they learned that we were investigating their case because we had sent them a settlement uh, uh, request. And her, their, Dr. Priest, their veterinarian, said that she had an excellent body condition and there was nothing wrong with her. This is very persuasive to our judge. Our judge in this case ordered the, uh, our veterinarian to evaluate the animals immediately. Our veterinarian concluded John was near death, and then uh, the sellers er, settled with us and let us take the animals to a sanctuary. John was now thriving. This is Najara, the other, anim the other lion. John Najara was in, in, in okay condition, considering. You'll notice that she has kind of a mane in this picture. That's because she has been inbred so many times that her testosterone levels are off. This is a picture of John when now she, they had to do an, an emergency procedure to remove a uh, obstruction in her in her intestine the size of a basketball, which was made up of hay. And the only way she gets hay is from her bedding material. So she was eating her bedding material because she was hungry, and that's why they're obligate gar carnivores, so she couldn't digest it. Um, but the Wild Animal Sanctuary staff removed that obstruction, and she's now doing really well. I just checked in with Pat Craig, who's the owner of the Wild Animal Sanctuary, uh, yesterday, and she's uh, starting. She's walking well now, and she's doing really well. Um, this is a picture of Jeff and I when we went to visit my daughter May, just for cuteness factor, and <laughs> the orange man, the man in orange is Pat Craig. Okay, so briefly, I'm so sorry. Um, we, I wanted to talk to you about the other cases that we filed. First, we filed a case against the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship because they were misinterpreting their definition of register um, to fully exempt people from the United States from the uh, ownership of dangerous wild animals provision. In Iowa, dangerous wild animals are absolutely prohibited from being owned, and that's um, a good rule. But they exempt people with USDA licenses as long as they register with Iowa Department of Agriculture. Well, the Iowa Department of Agriculture interprets register in this context differently from the way register actually is set out in the in the in the law. In the law, register means get make prove that you have um, prove that you have insurance, liability insurance for the event of an escape, 
prove that you have uh, documented and identi identified these animals and can no name them and, and know what happened to them in the event of escape and make sure that you have good veterinary care records. All of these things would prove fatal to the existence of the Cricket Hollow Zoo. They could not prove any of these things. They don't have money to get a liability insurance. So this is why we went after the Department of Agriculture to try and get them to correctly interpret the law. So right now we're in the Supreme Court case on a loss. The other case that we have been working on is we filed the, um, during this period, I heard, told you that the license was suspended. USDA also filed a license revocation proceeding against the Cricket Hollow Zoo in administrative, an administrative proceeding. They did this before trial and it's still ongoing. And um, we have attempted to intervene and are now in appeal because we lost the attempt to intervene. And then finally the licensure appeal, which Delcy will talk about, and I'm so sorry for cutting into your time. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm going to try and go quickly so that we do have some time for Q&A, because that's sometimes the most valuable part of these. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the Federal Animal Welfare Act and some implementation uh, issues as that applies to captive wildlife in the US. But I will briefly loop back to the Endangered Species Act towards the end. And then I want to conclude with a discussion of some really promising developments at the state and local level in the legislatures. So, just some very brief background on the Federal Animal Welfare Act for those who may not be familiar with it. The statute was enacted 50 years ago, and it regulates, among other things, animals who are used for exhibition, and it um, requires the humane care and treatment of these animals. It, um, it only covers warm-blooded animals, so you can see at the outset, as Kathy was suggesting yesterday, there are a large number of animals who are excluded. All cold-blooded animals, although we know that they are fully capable of suffering and feeling pain. Um, in addition, although birds are clearly warm-blooded, the USDA um, is not regulated them. And as a federal judge said a couple of years ago in a case I brought uh, against the agency for that failure, the USDA is, quote, failing to defend the country's feathered friends. In addition, because the AWA is focused on specific uses of animals, there are a large swath of captive wildlife, including mammals, who are just not covered at all. And that's all the um, animals who are used as so-called pets. Um, tigers, for example, estimates are that there are as many ten th as 10,000 in this country alone, which is far more than in the wild. Um, so anyone who wants to exhibit mammals to the public needs to get an Animal Welfare Act license, and um, they are then subjected to unannounced inspections by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And those inspections are intended to assess for compliance with minimum welfare standards that govern things like veterinary care, housing, food, et cetera. And it's important to keep in mind these are minimum baseline standards. Um, they're also, for the most part, very generalized performance-based standards. So just to give you one example, the space requirement for the vast majority of animals, tigers, elephants, bats, bears, et cetera, simply states that you, the animal needs to have enough space to, quote, make normal postural and social adjustments with adequate freedom of movement. That does not give a lot of guidance to, A, the regulated entity who's supposed to be complying with this, and B, the inspector who's supposed to be going out and assessing for compliance with that. So it's, it's a challenge. Add to this the fact that there are only about 125 inspectors charged with inspecting more than 15,000 locations and more than a million animals. Um, so I really don't envy the job that these inspectors have, and I have to say, I think most of them actually do a really good job, despite the circumstances that they're put in. And I'm going to be talking about a number of problems with the Animal Welfare Act, but I do not think the problems lie with, at the inspection level or with the inspectors. I think it's what happens or doesn't happen after an inspection is conducted. So an inspector goes out and documents violations like the ones Jessica showed us at Cricket Hollow. What happens after that? Usually nothing. Um, in the vast majority of cases, even when there are violations, there's no enforcement action. Um, if there is enforcement action, it's usually in the form of a warning, if you can call that enforcement. So this is an example from fiscal year 2015. It's pretty consistent across years. You can see that 72% of all enforcement, enforcement actions in that year were warnings. It's basically a letter the USDA sends out to the regulated entity saying, you violated the law, don't keep doing it. If you do, we might do something. Um, in the remainder of the cases, they're pretty much evenly divided between um, formal administrative complaints that lead to an administrative hearing um, and uh, 
settlement agreements, which are problematic because the penalties are severely reduced. So by statute, the AWA provides for a $10,000 penalty per violation, per animal, per day. So that can add up pretty quickly if, if properly calculated. But the USDA's own Office of Inspector General found that even in cases of egregious violations, things like animal deaths, penalties were reduced by 86% on average. So that means on average, egregious, egregious violators pay just 14 cents on the dollar for their violations. Um, to give you one example, um, as Jess mentioned, Cricket Hall Zoo has, I think you mentioned, maybe you didn't, <laughs> has entered into a number of these settlement agreements. Um, back in 2013, they faced at least $400,000 for a host of violations. I say at least because it's, it's hard to calculate because they don't always document how many animals are impacted by the particular violation. But at a minimum, it was $400,000. Uh, how, how much do you think that they paid? Any guesses? $6,857, so that's less than two cents on the dollar. Um, and that's typical, unfortunately. And it's not surprising that they continue to violate the law after that. Um, so I, I hope, although this has been brief, I've made the case to you that the Animal Welfare Act is not being adequately enforced. I could talk a lot more about that, and that's what some of my scholarship right now at Harvard focuses on. I did include in the materials one article that I've, um, a draft of an article on this, but for now, I think most of you probably wanna know what can we do about this? This is a problem, what can we do? So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so from a litigation perspective, it's really tricky. There's a little Supreme Court case called Heckler v. Cheney, which I don't think is emphasized enough in law schools usually, that establishes that as a general matter, you can't challenge an administrative agency's enforcement actions. And because the Animal Welfare Act, unlike the Endangered Species Act, doesn't have a citizen supervision, this means that the USDA pretty much has sole discretion over enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act. But you can challenge an agency's dis licensing decisions under the Administrative Procedure Act. So a little background on licensing under the Animal Welfare Act. As I mentioned, you need a license to engage in regulated activity, including exhibiting warm-blooded animals. And as to licensing, this is what the Animal Welfare Act says. Basically, no license shall be issued until the person has demonstrated compliance with all of the Animal Welfare Act standards that I talked about. So according to this, um, before someone can go into business exhibiting animals, the USDA does go out and inspect and requires full compliance with all of those standards. If you don't comply, you're gonna need to fix that before you can get a license. So here's where the problem arises. Under current policy, once that initial license is given out, it's good for 12 months. After that, it expires if you don't do anything. But if you submit a form and a very small fee, which hasn't been adjusted in more than 25 years, even for inflation, um, <laughs> the USDA automatically renews your license. Whether you are egregiously violating the act, no matter what you're doing, they will grant it. So, to use Cricket Hollow again as an example, <laughs> Um, in May 2015, May 27th, 2015, the USDA went out and inspected Cricket Hollow, and as often, <laughs> they, they documented a bunch of violations. They cited the facility for violating 11 different animal welfare standards, and that was affecting at least 77 animals, and likely more, but it wasn't fully documented in the report. Um, and in the interest of time, I won't go into detail, but they're, they're very sad violations. Um, that very same day, the USDA renewed Cricket Hollow Zoo's license. The same day. What? <laughs> How does that jibe with this statutory language that you need to demonstrate compliance in order for a license to be issued? It doesn't seem to, right? Um, so as Jessica indicated, ALDF sued the USDA over giving this renewal license out. And that's not the only case of its kind. In a case that I argued, um, ALDF, PETA, and a coalition of others, uh, groups and individuals, so the USDA over the Miami Seaquarium's license being renewed. And the Seaquarium is where the sole orca Lolita is held. Um, Lolita is held in the smallest orca tank in North America. And unlike most animals, uh, the Animal Welfare Act does provide engineering standards for marine mammal space requirements. They're decades old and woefully inadequate, but they do exist. And 
Lolita's tank doesn't even meet those requirements. In addition, the Animal Welfare Act requires that marine mammals who are social in the wild, which orcas undisputably are, need to be kept with um, others of their kind, basically. Lolita has been alone since 1980, when her companion Hugo slammed his head into the side of the tank, some believe on purpose, and killed himself. Despite this, every year, like clockwork, the USDA renews Miami's Aquarium's license, just like it renews Cricket Hollow Zoo's license. The agency itself has described license renewal as, quote, rubber stamping, and as a purely administrative and automatic process. So in addition to flying in the face of the statutory mandate that no license shall be issued without a demonstration of compliance, it undermines the Animal Welfare Act's stated purpose of ensuring the humane care and treatment of these animals, because by giving out these licenses, the agency is basically facilitating ongoing inhumane care and treatment of animals and allowing these places to do business as usual. It also wastes agency resources. So by licensing chronically, chronic violators, the agency has to then conduct inspections of these facilities, and because they use a risks-based inspection system, they inspect those facilities more than other facilities, um, which is good, but if they weren't allowing them to continue doing business, they wouldn't even need to do that. They also spend a disproportionate number of resources trying to revoke those licenses after they give them out. <laughs> so what have courts said about this issue so far? I'm sorry to say that we have not been successful yet. Um, Anyone who knows anything about administrative law knows it's really hard to challenge agency action. They get a huge amount of deference in the courts. And so what the USDA has argued and the courts have so far accepted is that, just back to that statutory language, renewing a license isn't necessarily the same thing as issuing a license. You can see that word issue in the statute. This is currently on appeal in uh, two federal circuit courts, in the Eighth Circuit in the Cricket Hollow Zoo case, and then in the Fourth Circuit in another case brought by PETA, which challenges the renewal of five separate licenses, um, including Tri-State Zoo, which is a roadside zoo in Maryland where these animals here are, are held. I'm cautiously optimistic about these appeals. I think they're really important cases. But I think that regardless of the outcome of these appeals, um, the decisions so far have, have been a really important development. So um, what the courts have said when in ruling in the USDA's favor is that the term issue in the statute is ambiguous. It could include renewal. It could not. And that doesn't sound significant. And I will try to simplify this and explain why it is significant in my view. Um, so more than 25 years ago, the Office of Inspector General actually raised this renewal issue. So the litigation wasn't the first time it's been brought up. And the Inspector General said the failure to require um, compliance for license renewal results in, quote, reduced assurance that animal care facilities will make required corrections to comply with the provisions of the act to ensure the humane care and treatment of the animals. Basically, automatic renewal is undermining the purpose of the statute. How did the agency respond? The agency said, we don't have the authority to not renew. We legally have to renew every license that comes across our desk, our, every license renewal application. Um, the issue more or less died after a couple OIG reports until these lawsuits were brought. But what these decisions make clear, even if they're upheld, is that the USDA does have discretion to treat renewal as an issuance and therefore to condition it on compliance. Um, so I think it's really important that we hold the agency's feet to the fire, uh, first in this ongoing litigation, but even if that is not successful, which I hope is not the case, but even if it is, through regulatory and, if necessary, even legislative fronts, because this is automatic renewal is severely compounding and amplifying the enforcement problems of the Animal Welfare Act, which can't really be reached through judicial review. So um, I'm going to switch over to the, Anim uh, sorry, to the Endangered Species Act. But I first, I would be remiss if I did not plug a conference that we're having at Harvard in a couple months. Um, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> so December 2nd and 3rd, we are having our, the Animal Law and Policy Program's inaugural conference. And it's the Animal Welfare Act at 50. We're convening experts um, from NGOs, industry, USDA itself, and others 
to assess the last 50 years of the Animal Welfare Act and consider recommendations for the future. And um, space is limited. It's going to be a really good conference. I encourage everyone to pick up one of these uh, flyers if you haven't gotten one and to register as soon as you can. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so as Jessica discussed, the Endangered Species Act plainly applies to captive animals as well as their wild counterparts. And it, this can be a really important tool for these animals because the Endangered Species Act has a citizen suit provision. Just to give you one example, in addition to the animals at Cricket Hollow Zoo, Jessica talked about, um, this is Joe. Joe was used in the entertainment industry and then basically thrown away at the Mobile Zoo in Alabama. And he was kept at the Mobile Zoo in a little uh, chain link pen for 15 years. And um, PETA recently brought an Endangered Species Act suit on Joe's behalf. And as a result, Joe is now at Save the Chimps in a social um, setting and a, a vast, rich habitat. And Joe is actually the seventh solitary chimpanzee from exhibitors that PETA has rescued just in the last few years. So there's tremendous potential here. Um, but it's really important to note that other animals, even though they're endangered, are still languishing despite Endangered Species Act efforts on their behalf. And there are two really important cases currently on appeal that I would keep your eye on if you care about these issues. So the first is a lawsuit um, separate from the USDA lawsuit regarding the Miami Aquarium that I talked about, um, but also on behalf of Lolita at the Miami Aquarium. And the second is a lawsuit brought by two elders of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians regarding the treatment of captive grizzly bears at the Cherokee Bear Zoo in North Carolina who are kept in virtually barren concrete pits. And in both of those cases, the district courts clearly recognized that these animals were being held in harmful substandard conditions, but declined to grant relief under the Endangered Species Act, essentially on the ground that um, the USDA hadn't done anything under the Animal Welfare Act. It was being tolerated under the Animal Welfare Act, so nothing could be done under the Endangered Species Act. It's, it's a little more nuanced than that. I, can't, I don't have time to get into it, but I did include both of those district court opinions in the materials. Um, the stakes are really high in these appeals. I mean, basically, the future of the ability of the Endangered Species Act to protect captive wildlife hinges on the outcome of these cases. Um, so I have to say, as the person who's going to be arguing Lolita's case in the 11th Circuit, I feel a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, so that's, those are really important cases if we want to keep being able to help these animals. Finally, on a more optimistic note, on the legislative front, I think there have been some really exciting developments. And there are a way that any of us, whether we're a lawyer, a law student, or just interested in these issues, can get involved. And in the 10 plus years that I've been involved in captive wildlife issues, I think I've seen the most um, developments in this area, um, especially at the policy level. It's different than rescuing an individual animal like Joe. Um, so one example uh, are bullhook bands. So for those who don't know, bullhooks are heavy batons, basically, with a sharp um, hook and point at the end that are used to to manage elephants, and they inflict pain on elephants, basically. And a number of, thank you, um, localities have banned bull hooks, and then just this year, two states, California and Rhode Island, also banned bull hooks. And this has been really um, monumental. Ringling Brothers actually specifically cited these ordinances in their decision to quote unquote, retired the elephants, which is a separate issue. <laughs> um, but that was, that was a really important development. Um, and you'll never see a circus handler with an elephant without a bull hook. It might be hard to see. Oftentimes, they'll put black electric tape around the, tip, uh, the top, just leaving the very sharp point exposed. Um, and or they'll put them up their sleeve. So you can't see most of the device, but they will always have them. Um, a number of local jurisdictions have gone even further and banned um, all traveling wild animal acts. And Cambridge, Massachusetts, and San Francisco, California are just a couple examples. New York City is also considering doing that now. And there's a hearing on October 20th. For those of you who are local, I encourage you to go and testify. Um, 
And similarly, this year California also banned keeping orcas in, in captivity. So it's virtually impossible to get anything legislatively done at the federal level, but there's a huge amount that can be done at the state and local level. And as I said, we can all get involved. It's a way of uh, getting a, addressing the failures of the USDA and getting some help to these animals. Um, so I think I'm actually going to end early because I rushed through. <laughs> so we'll have more time for questions. Um, yeah, I just I think we're at a really exciting time for captive wildlife between you know being in a post Blackfish era, Ringling having retired their elephants. We're going to see more and more of these developments. Um, but there are some important issues being litigated that we really hopefully will prevail on and some really great opportunities to get involved. Thanks. Thank you both so much. We have about 12 minutes for questions. I would ask that you, if you have questions, because there are so many people in the room, we don't have that much time. If you have questions that are very individualized and specific in the sense of how can you directly help me resolve this particular problem, I would ask that you do that one-on-one -on -one with one of the speakers after the session is over. So I will open it up to the two of you to just pick and choose. My interest is in understanding the confidence between the Endangered Species Act as applied here in relation to international conventions. Because it seems there's a disconnect. If you cannot protect an elephant or a tiger, how, how does that play for the international scale? Yeah, that's, that's a really big question. and very salient since we're just coming out of the CITES convention. Briefly, um, the U.S. Endangered Species Act implements CITES, so it's a, the legislative way of implementing that treaty. It is, the Supreme Court has said it's the most comprehensive um, conservation statute ever passed by any country, and I think that remains true. So the other parties to the treaty have not necessarily implemented such strong um, implementation measures, and it's really hard to enforce treaties as folks involved in international law, and I think we're going to hear on the next panel or panel later today. Um, that said, as far as U.S. government impacts, um, we can control the import of elephants, for example, or tigers. Um, those will be covered by the Native Species Act, but in terms of other things happening abroad, it's, it's much more limited. Um, my story is probably a little bit more common. Uh, I was an environmental lawyer for the Attorney General's office and um, started the Canine Cruelty Prevention Unit and decided I wanted to do something more, so I, got, I applied and, and was lucky to get this position at ALDF. Um, when I came to ALDF, I had, uh, enforcing the State Animal Welfare Act in Missouri had given me a lot of litigation experience and trial experience working with the Animal Welfare Act and inspection reports. And so I wanted to use that um, knowledge and expertise on the federal level to challenge the federal government because they are the ones who are doing the poor job. The states are sometimes, in some cases, doing a, a decent job, but the, the feds are not. So. That's sort of my story and how I got started. So Yeah, so I went to law school specifically to do animal law, but I wouldn't say I focused on that in law school. In law school, I just really focused on becoming the best possible lawyer that I could. Um, but I planned to focus on factory farming issues when I got out of law school, and I, I actually did work for Farm Sanctuary for a year. Um, but I worked for a firm that's Meyer Glitzenstein and Eubanks now, which I encourage any of you who are students looking for opportunities to look into. And I did do all animal law there, but I was assigned a number of captive wildlife cases. So I, I drafted a complaint that resulted in the seizure of two circus elephants, um, Tina and Jewel. And I also worked on um, an Endangered Species Act trial against Ringling Brothers Circus for their treatment of elephants. And basically I was hooked at that point. Uh, orange? 
My question is for Delcy, um, which is you had mentioned that the uh, USDA in response to the OIG report said they were legally required to renew the licenses, so I'm just curious what the text they pointed to, and if they didn't point to text, why do you think they keep doing it? Because you said up front that you don't think it's the people, and so I'm curious what it could be other than the people. Just to clarify, I don't think it's the inspectors. <laughs> <laughs> As you move up the chain, I believe there is more responsibility for these issues. Um, so briefly, and I can send you a draft article about this issue also if you're interested in learning more, the USDA has basically relied on due process arguments, and they've recycled those arguments in the recent litigation. And basically what they've said is, well, the statute says we can't revoke or suspend a license without a hearing. Um, therefore, to not renew, we need to give a hearing. That's not true. I go into that in my article under the Constitution, that's not true. Under the Administrative Procedure Act, that's not true. Very clear, that is not the case. Um, but they were not pushed on that, and the OIG is not known for following up on their, their findings. So. Hi, my name is Rebecca Brenner. I do animal law, and I'm counseling and litigation in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I have a procedural question, because I'm very curious, and, it, and it's mainly for Jessica. When you were showing at the beginning, uh, towards the beginning of your presentation, veterinary records and handwritten notes, mm -hmm. did you get that through either freedom of information, or did it come through regular document discovery? Oh, that's a yeah. and, and was it a fight to actually get those documents? So, the, um, under the Animal Welfare Act, in, in exhibitors are not required to retain, uh, or I'm sorry, the USDA is not required to retain all e evidence of compliance. The exhibitor is required to retain it. So you cannot get that level of detail or information from a FOIA request. Um, you have to engage in litigation. And so when we sued the Krikahau Zoo, one of the first things we did was serve discovery on them. And they did not fight it. They, they were, they're a fairly unsophisticated party. Um, and so they didn't, I don't think they realized how damning the evidence would have been that they turned over to us. Well, they didn't have counsel? They had counsel. He's just, in Iowa, there's not a lot of people that specialize in captive wildlife litigation. Um, so they, t they turned it over to us uh, without comment. And to, and to this day, they stand behind Dr. Priest and don't believe that he has ever done anything wrong and they believe he's an excellent vet. One of the things that we asked for them to do, we, we engaged in settlement negotiations with them on several occasions. One of our conditions for settlement was that Dr. Priest no longer be allowed to serve as the vet and that they find someone qualified. Because there are people who are qualified in Iowa. There are two um, zoos that are credited by the AZA and they have a university that does um, a lot of agricultural work and has cap, like big cats and classes on big cats and they could, they could do the work. Uh, but they just refuse. They just refuse. So that procedurally, we got them through discovery. Um, we didn't have to fight, and you will never get anything like that from USDA. Short answer. <laughs> I want to add to that, though, um, not Cricket Hollow, but a lot of zoos, both AZA zoos and roadside zoos, are owned by state or local governments, local more often. Well, that's true. And so I've gotten these kinds of records through public records requests for those kinds of facilities. Um, I live in rural northwestern Pennsylvania, and about four, three miles from a really crappy roadside zoo that is incited many times by the USDA, and I agree with you, it's not any of the people that are doing the inspections, it's they go higher up. Um, but the area I live in, um, you say going by the national level is going to work much to go state and local. I live in an area where um, People chain their dog. I, it's it really concerning me. Um, and I would not know, in general, if I lived in one of the type of areas I live in, how to go about starting to get anything done. Because I know that there has been um, proposals to do some things. This is a, by family organization that's run the zoo for 50 years. Small town, individual family. And I'm assuming these things are common. What would be a tactic to try? general to do something, knowing that, as you're saying, they've got numerous violations and someone actually posted them, and it's gotten nowhere. Um, yeah, there, these things are very common. As you say, there are hundreds and hundreds of exhibitors, only a tiny fraction of those are accredited by the AZA. 
Um, that said, we should probably talk one-on-one, -on -one, but I will say there have been some successful efforts in, in Pennsylvania, even that I know of Pima Tuning. There's some efforts. Is it Pima Tuning? Well, we should definitely talk. Um, I think Jim Max was also in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you should yeah. look at the complaints that, or ask um, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, we can send them to you, for Jim Max Ice Cream Truck and for the Animal Land Roadside Zoo. Both of those complaints will show you exactly the roadmap that you need to follow to shut a zoo like this down in Pennsylvania. Some states have really good laws for this, and Pennsylvania, we've had enormous success. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, in terms of um, putting pressure at the, at the federal level, I'm not sure how useful it is, but particularly when the parties are just so tied up, but um, using something like the, the Office of Government Accountability and the studies that they do, as well as looking at, you talked about the OIG, in terms of if you can find sympathetic members of Congress who can push in order to have important studies done, and then that result is something. And is that something that is sort of looked at in terms of a strategy for getting data? And as I said, essentially getting the government to fund the research regarding its own, you know, inappropriate use of <coughs> resources. Yeah, that's been a really, I, I think that's where Congress can actually be useful even given the deadlock. And that's, I know PETA for one has used that strategy and um, sympathetic members of Congress have basically detailed specific questions to agencies. We want this information and gotten information that way and been able to put pressure on the agencies. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's still a slow process, but it definitely, definitely helps. And it really helps if those people hear from their constituents. I'm interested in uh, what Ms. Wendell talked about when you said that you're doing some work on the policy level, and especially given uh, how captive animal populations in America sort of uh, compare to wild populations of the same species in, you know, outside of the continent. For instance, if, you, if we assume that every zoo in America has at least one lion, that would account for about 3,000 lions Activity. Whereas, for instance, the, the numbers in Kenya as of February of this year were 2,500 lions in the world. It would mean mm -hmm. that we have more <laughs> lions in captivity than we have lions in <coughs> So I'm wondering whether there's any work that you're doing at a policy level to convince the federal government on how to bring down the number of zoos or. You know, mm -hmm. yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could talk all day about that. One particular example really comes to mind, um, especially with the lion example that you raised. So um, currently, the Fish and Wildlife Service gives out what are called captive bred wildlife permits, and that allows people to um, buy and sell and do other otherwise prohibited things with endangered wildlife, um, including tigers, um, lions are threatened, not endangered, but, um, and they're giving those out willy-nilly. Um, the ESA states that those per permits should only be given out if it's for a, a true conservation purpose, it will help animals in the wild. They're not adhering to really any standard and they're giving these out to facilities that are not breeding for genetic integrity. So all, all of the tigers in the US, except for the handful in AZA facilities, are mixed subspecies tigers, which have no conservation value, even if you believe that captive breeding can be helpful for conservation. These animals are, they're, they're subspecies that have no interaction in the wild, and that's, um, lions are similarly hybridized, panthers similarly, so um, I think urging Fish and Wildlife to amend their policies with regard to who they're allowing to breed and trade and deal in these animals will, if successful, go far on that issue. I'll, I'll briefly add that we included a claim for trafficking um, related to the fact that the Cricket Hollow Zoo did not have this captive bred wildlife permit and they were still trafficking in, in cubs, in tiger and lion cubs, and our judge completely ignored it. So that is also on appeal. <laughs> Please join me once again in thanking them both for a wonderful panel.